Welcome everyone to the Corn Brief Podcast, Episode 6. Uh, we're your hosts, Sean Wintz. And Evan Fagger. And we talk about the latest news and developments every week in the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency space. Uh, lots of news happened this week, lots of interesting stuff. So let's get right to it. Uh, the Silk Road auction of the Bitcoins that we've been anticipating for several weeks now uh, have finally happened. And there was one winner, one single winner in the whole auction who won nearly, or it was nearly 30,000 Bitcoins. One person won all of them. And uh, so, Evan, uh, who, who was the single winner of the Silk Road Bitcoins? The winner of the Silk Road Bitcoins is a venture capitalist named Tim Draper. And um, he is an investor in a company named Verum, or however you say it. Yeah, I like and, to say um, Verum. Verum. <laughs> and uh, Tim Draper and uh, is working with Verum, Verum, whatever. Uh, he, Tim Draper and this company plan to use those Silk Road Bitcoins to... Um, get Bitcoin into emerging markets with weak currencies. Okay. And this news came uh, like a day a day after, I think, uh, a day after the Marshalls announced that one person won them all. And then the CEO of Verum uh, made a blog post about it saying that Tim Draper was the guy and this is what we're going to do with it. And um, so that's how he found out who won the Bitcoins and their project... It's pretty interesting. Yeah. So what? What they're gonna they're gonna provide liquidity to emerging markets with with weak currencies? Are they like referring to Argentina and Venezuela and countries like that? Yeah. The, um, from what I take from it is they're gonna encourage the acceptance of Bitcoin in um, in emerging markets, which are developing countries whose uh, economies are improving and they're like becoming global competitors. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, but their people are still generally poor. Um, so hmm. these would be several of the South American countries. I don't know if China would still be considered as an emerging market. Um, but these countries, one thing they have in common is they have uh, very weak currencies, uh, mostly caused by, uh, government depreciation. Um, because a lot of these currency or not currencies, a lot of these countries are, uh, former uh, socialist countries or socialist leaning countries mm. so the um like back in the 20th century in, in the 70s and 80s they had um a lot of inflation because their central bank banks printed a lot of money to fund all these socialist projects so now they have really weak currencies and tim draper and Verum are looking to fix that okay so do you, do you think it's gonna have a have a big effect um, on these, well, f actually, first of all, do you think that uh, the Silk Road Bitcoins are going to actually, I don't know, like help this this venture out and and make make Verum more profitable, more successful? Yeah, because um, th their whole point, they said that their their entire goal is to introduce uh, liquidity into these emerging markets, and so you know, getting more money obviously increases your liquidity. So. Yeah. Um, Having these coins, it's just um, it's just a simple fact that they're gonna have more money to inject into these countries. So yeah, it's gonna it's gonna help. Um, and if it works, if they can get businesses to use Bitcoin or like you know local economies trading exclusively in Bitcoin, um, mm. it'll it'll definitely help these poor people out in in the developing countries because. Um, at that point, if they can go anywhere and buy everything they need with Bitcoin, you know they won't have to worry about dealing with their um, with their weak uh, government currencies. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, ideally, like uh, that should provide a lot of help to people who, you know, that they want to get out of poverty, but it's so difficult for them because their own government is debasing their own currency by so much. Um, like Argentina is the example that keeps coming to my mind. Um, their inflation is really, really terrible. And people, it's really hard for people to be economically successful when your own money system is basically bullshit. It's basically bullshit because of what the government does to it. Yep. Yeah, in Argentina, they, I mean, they have like extremely high inflation. Um, and it's the kind of inflation that our central bank says is impossible to happen. So they say it'll never happen. 
but obviously yeah. it's happening in Argentina and it's happening in a lot of under, other countries as well. Mm-hmm. So yeah, these people, uh, like average citizens, just can't get ahead because the price of everything is always rising. You know, they can barely afford to live. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, much less become wealthy. So hopefully this Bitcoin project will um, help alleviate some of that poverty. Okay. So let's let's move into a couple different angles on this same story. Uh, first of all, um, I was partially wrong in my prediction that the U.S. Marshals would screw this up some more. I thought that uh, it would either take them really long to send out the coins to the winner or they would mess it up and send it to the wrong person or send part of it to the wrong person. But uh, maybe it was because there was only one winner, but the transaction happened really smoothly. Uh, Tim Draper got all 29,655 bitcoins in one transaction. People online, regular people, actually saw the transaction happen on the blockchain faster than the uh, Varum and, and Tim Draper were able to announce it on their blog post. So it actually happened really smoothly. Uh, were you were you well, as surprised as, as I was about that? I was surprised, but this is only a small chunk of the Silk Road stash. It's true. Uh, they're going to be auctioning off a lot more, so they, there's still plenty of time for them to mess up. That's true. Yeah, there's <laughs> over 100,000 left that are yep. still uh, sitting in limbo, sitting probably in a hard drive somewhere in some federal office, you know? Yep, all we need is the right hacker to get in there. <laughs> Not that we are <laughs> suggesting anything, but uh, nope, it's, it'll, I definitely be interesting. Be it. it'll be interesting to see what happens. But yeah, we, there's still a long way to go and plenty of ways to mess up. Um, so another another angle of this is that, in a way, the government is kind of giving their approval to Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and demonstrating that the coins, despite having been used on Silk Road for supposedly illegal activities, and the the operation of that website was inherently illegal in so many federal laws, despite that, the government sold all of them, well, the, the Silk Road uh, user account coins, and to to a venture venture capitalist who's who's going to use them for a different venture entirely in these emerging markets. So it's a really an affirmation of the fungibility of Bitcoin in the eyes of the government itself. If they have if they try to enact this uh, this blacklisting strategy or and greenlisting strategy that some in the community have feared, where they uh, taint certain coins because they were used in previous Ill- illegal activities. Uh, they really they can't implement that anymore, else they would be total and complete hypocrites for previously selling the Silk Road bitcoins for a profit. Basically. Yeah, and I, I also see it as kind of like um, an admission of defeat um, because you know governments all around the world are are trying to get people to not use bitcoin china has like actually um tried to ban bitcoin and is like they tried to shut down all the exchanges in china and they're going after people that are using it and um uh you know the IRS just recently uh in america the IRS just recently tried to um uh tried to tax Bitcoin, and they, they made it uh, such a difficult process that um, anyone who tried to comply with it uh, just wouldn't be able to do so. So that could definitely discourage a lot of people from using it. So we can see governments all around the world uh, trying to, to uh, get rid of Bitcoin. And um, so I think the fact that uh, the federal government, uh, instead of denying Bitcoin is valuable, and uh, just letting it, just letting those coins sit in a hard drive somewhere. Yeah. Um, instead, they're selling them and profiting off of them. Yeah. Um, I think it's a sign that they've just given up. You know, they've realized that they can't get rid of it. Um, just like, just like they did with the drug war. You know, they've uh, they've realized a long time ago that they're yeah. not going to stop people from using drugs, but they keep waging this war because. They make so much money off of it because they have an excuse to print more money and they have an excuse to raise taxes. Yeah. And for um, profit prisons. There's a whole list yeah. of incentives for the drug war. And um, you know, there's also some people who believe. I'm not saying I believe it, um, but there's also some people who believe uh, that the CIA gets a lot of their funding for their black budget that nobody knows about from um, 
it, drug sales from and such. engaging in exchange with the South American drug cartels. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think we're seeing the same thing happening with Bitcoin. The government uh, knows that they've lost, so they're just deciding to make as much money off of it as they can, just like they're doing with the drug war. Um, so I think it's, uh, I think it's, you know, pretty strong legitimization of Bitcoin. Yeah. Like, uh, the government, if, if they were hypothetically listening to us right now, they would probably respond with the claim that, oh, we just wanted to sell them in this auction because that's what the U.S. Marshals do. They sell seized items that they get in uh, other... They raid, they do drug raids and confiscate all kinds of products and, you know, cars and such from drug dealers. Yeah. And they just sell it in an auction style and make money off it. So they would respond, oh, Bitcoin, it's just an asset that we that we stole, <laughs> confiscated from uh, DPR's hard drive. And we just want to sell it because it's worth something. And, you know, it's just a confiscated good. But it's that's still an admission that it has a lot of value and it, and it's worth a lot and the government the federal marshals obviously don't have any practical use for the bitcoins so they they just want to sell it but either way it's something valuable and and it's probably going to provide a lot of help to um these emerging markets thanks to Tim Draper and Varum and it's going to give a lot of money to the federal government if they keep doing dark net market busts. <laughs> mm, yeah, true. Probably another one of one of those is coming down the line. There's so many dark net markets now, and there's still a lot of insecure ones. Uh, so um, let's move on to another topic. Uh, what do we What do we got here? We've got uh, California has officially legalized Bitcoin in uh, that state. The governor has officially signed the bill and put it into law. The bill that I previously wrote an article on it a few weeks back when it exited a Senate committee and went to a vote on the Senate floor. And now Jerry Brown has signed it into law. It struck out a part of the corporation's code that basically said individuals or any groups cannot make their own currency for you know circulation in public which would theoretically ban Bitcoin, which is created by miners on a, on a network. Um, but, you know, now explicitly, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are legal in California. And, you know, the, the California legislature is giving the go-ahead to corporations, businesses, regular people alike. Make cryptocurrencies, make your own, whatever, and, and go to town with it. So uh, what, do you, what do you think about this latest um, legalization regulation? I think it's uh, really positive that state governments are um, starting to acknowledge it, and they're and instead of banning or trying trying to ban it or discourage its use, like the federal government is, there's a few states that actually uh, encourage its use, and yeah. so um, I think um, making a conscious effort to um, to facilitate trade with Bitcoin, I think it's yeah. uh, really positive. And I also saw on Reddit, I can't find it anymore, but um, I think it was Oregon, either Oregon or Ohio, one of those states, um, they're working on uh, making it legal for politicians to accept campaign donations in Bitcoin. Uh, yeah, nice. Because so I think the, the, FC, the FEC has put out a few rulings um, recently in the past couple of months to kind of put forth guidelines for politicians who want to accept Bitcoin for federal campaigns, but it's good to hear that states are starting to do that as well for, you know, state politicians and make it comfortable for them to accept Bitcoin. Yeah, and I, th um, like, I think this is really good news uh, in America, especially since in the international community uh, in the past, like, two weeks, uh, Bitcoin has been getting a lot of, like, uh, negativity because um, I wrote uh, two articles about uh, these two uh, stories, the OECD and um, the FATF, the Financial Action Task Force. Uh, two of these international organizations wrote papers um, saying that Bitcoin is interesting, but it will never go anywhere. Um, the OECD mm -hmm. specifically said uh, Bitcoin will never become an alternative to legal tender 
um, because governments can't make taxes payable in Bitcoin because it's impossible to track. I personally think that's a positive, um, but this OECD yeah. paper uh, clearly uh, wanted to paint that as a negative, and the FATF paper uh, is basically just a big uh, warning to governments that uh, Bitcoin poses a very serious threat to them, and so that they should uh, you know, try to get rid of it at all costs is basically what the paper said. And so that you know that's some pretty negative uh, international news. So it's good that at least in um, the United States, it's getting some positivity. Yeah, yeah. The United States is actually one of the countries that has warmed up to Bitcoin the most, to the surprise of a lot of people. This started back in November when the Senate hearing first happened, and politicians actually like the idea a lot with uh, lower transaction fees, and they just don't want people to commit crime on the network. But yeah, California, other states are doing it. Uh, the U.S. government has, you know, tenuous relationship with it. They actually recognize it as something valuable, at least. But um, going back to the OECD thing, um, do you do you, do you think that it will actually convince governments to to try and have a more hostile stance towards Bitcoin? Do you think it actually has clout in the political um. stage? I don't think it would encourage them to be any more negative towards it than they already are, because you know there there are several countries. China, in particular, has outright banned it, and um, mm. Mm. and uh, the European Central Bank, which obviously represents the entire continent of Europe, basically, um, or everyone in the EU, which is you know a big chunk of Europe, um, they've said Bitcoin is bad. Um, Argentina, you know. Uh, passively threatened everyone in uh, its country that uses Bitcoin by reminding them that using Bitcoin violates their legal tender laws, so they should be cautious with that. So, uh, you know, governments around the world are pretty negative towards it. Um, yeah. But I think these, like, international economics institutions Force these governments' beliefs uh, and actions in trying to discourage its use, but um, ultimately, what the governments think about it doesn't matter. It's whether or not the individuals use it, and I don't right. think papers like this are really affecting those uh, those people's opinions. Yeah, yeah. Most people don't really care, and most of the people actually reading those t those kinds of papers that come out are people like us who are already involved in Bitcoin, and we're already. Uh, you know, trading it and, and investing with it and, and paying people with it and getting payments with it. Like, we're not going to listen to that paper anyway. It's just kind of like an intellectual, uh, you know, interesting thing to read about and kind of toy with. But it's not going to... I would be personally surprised if governments start uh, being more hostile towards Bitcoin, thanks to yeah, that. Yeah, and, and like I said, in these, in these two papers, the, th the things that these two organizations uh, highlighted as negatives... Uh, they're actually things that a lot of people in the Bitcoin community uh, see as positives in mm -hmm. Bitcoin. So, you know, most of the people in the Bitcoin community, I know, me personally, don't even take papers like this seriously. In, in my opinion, like the original point of governments and such is to have a public pool of funds that everyone pays taxes into. And then from that, you can do public goods, build stuff that everyone uses out of that. But now with Bitcoin, uh, we, we have ways for people to easily voluntarily uh, donate their own money to a public cause. Crowdfunding sites started up a couple years ago, but now we have Bitcoin. It's super easy for people to contribute funds publicly. And that's what Mike Hearn's Lighthouse is trying to do as well. Um, create a way for pe people to easily donate funds uh, to a public good. But governments... Like they're they're out of control. They they spend too much money on military, U.S. government specifically, and that's not really what people want to fund anymore with their hard-earned dollars. So that's why they're kind of afraid they're going to lose their influence to Bitcoin. Yeah, and I think I think uh, personally that uh, voluntary transactions are a much more uh, efficient way to provide public goods like roads and electricity and things like that. Yeah. Um. 
because also it, it subjects these uh, public goods to um, the innovation of the free market. And so you you won't have things like this like terribly outdated electrical grid that we have. Uh, you know, we, we would have uh, self-sustaining decentralized electricity uh, that is like it's, it's invulnerable to many of the many things that could take our electric grid out. And um, I think that if private companies actually owned the roads, they would be a lot better. Yeah, I just want to point out that I live in, in a state that has one of the highest, if not the highest, gas taxes in the country, and our roads are awful. <laughs> huh. And uh, so, yeah. so obviously, uh, we don't have a funding problem because we get we. We have some of the highest funding for roads in the country, and yet we have some of the worst roads I've ever seen. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so yeah, I think Bitcoin is a step towards creating a more voluntary society uh, where public goods are are treated more like um, more like functions or products of the of uh, private enterprise, and so they'll be provided much more efficiently and at a much higher quality. And pro- yeah. most more than likely at a lower price. Yeah, I mean, you would. I, I, I'm surprised that the government um, hasn't, you know, gone more in the direction towards having uh, private ownership of some public resources. Um, I mean, the government's so in bed with corporations already. Uh, why haven't they, you know, let let corporations and businesses uh, improve on roads and parks and such? Um, for for a price, I don't know. Maybe, maybe they they're just paralyzed or something, and they they're too scared to lose their influence already. Yeah, um, I just I read an article about the city. I think it was in Georgia. Um, the city government actually passed a bill uh, some amount of years ago to privatize the entire city. And they they actually they actually sold all of the public services to one company, and um, wow. And if the and if the people of that city were dissatisfied with the services of that company, they could vote to fire that company and hire a new company to take over. Wow, and, interesting. Um, and apparently, everybody loves it. Like er, like like uh, the quality of life has improved so much since they let this private. Uh, enterprise take over wow now that that's not really the the system i'm advocating because that's basically you know trading a government monopoly for a private monopoly uh-huh. which is not really free enterprise but um it's it's proof that when uh that private companies that provide goods and services uh it it's proof that these types of companies are held accountable much more so than governments and they provide better products uh-huh uh-huh yeah, well, um, hopefully, hopefully, Bitcoin uh, does does more to spur that change and make it happen faster. Because if if we get some of these decentralized mechanisms mechanisms in place where people can start funding public projects and such uh, with their own with their own voluntary voluntarily given money, then yeah, governments could become obsolete. And that's why they're threatened, right? That's why they're they're afraid they're going to lose their ability to to you know, tax people. Yeah, or you know, or at least they, you know, at the very least, they would just become much smaller. Mm. And uh, mm. y- you know, if everybody used Bitcoin, obviously the central bank would be useless, and um, it would be so hard to tax people who use Bitcoin that um, they would rely on voluntary donations to fund their services mm. so at that point a, a government would basically be um a private company competing on a free market because because if they can't forcibly take taxes they have to rely on voluntary donations yeah donations. and that should spur um, them to they make they a better product right to, yeah they actually have to satisfy people um so maybe if it doesn't completely eliminate government, it would like fundamentally change the way that they operated. And if something like what I just said happens, there are a lot of people um, who wouldn't really consider that government at all. It would just be you know another private company. So um, 
Yeah. That's a utopian fantasy we we can work towards. <laughs> yeah, we're making progress. We're making progress. Yeah. You know, one little bit at a time. All right. So, um, from there, let's move on to a different topic. Um, so earlier this week, or in during the lot, last podcast, actually, we did a segment on Redcoin and its potential as the uh, social currency being you know tipped on Twitter and YouTube and Reddit and Facebook and such. And the video went viral uh, the following weekend and got over 8,000 views. And then on Tuesday, it was taken down by YouTube for violating the terms of service, supposedly, uh, for getting views. And they claimed that there were fake views on, on the video and re-uploaded it shortly after uh, with the view count put down back down to zero, uh, no more comments, uh, you know, no more stats or anything, just a brand new video copy of the original thing. So at, at, at first, we at CoinBrief thought that, um, you know, uh, that, that all, all, all the views were real um, because that's, that's what it appeared to us. None of us, like, uh, set out any bots or anything. We don't even know how to do that, really, to, to generate fake views. And we would just create new content anyway instead of trying to rack up fake views on an already made video. But... Um, uh, so, so what what new developments have happened? Um, basically, it's the views. Some of the views were fake and were embed. Or the video was embedded on malware sites or something. Uh, yeah, Dustin, the editor and co-founder of CoinBrief, found out that um, he was like looking at some analytics uh, for the video, yeah. and um, he saw some of the. Uh, some of the websites that our video got um, posted to uh, and they were like known um, websites they're known for like having uh, malicious content or like having malware on them or something mm. so um, what we think is that uh, uh, for whatever reason somebody wanted to take our video down or possibly get our channel suspended um, so they use some kind of bot or something to uh, get our video posted on all these shady websites to generate mm. all these artificial views so mm. we would violate the terms of service with YouTube. Yeah, okay. So I um this this could go either way, right? This could be a malicious actor who wanted you know, has a problem with us for some whatever reason and wanted to, you know, take one of our videos down. Or it could be a fanatical uh, red coin like um, fan, basically, who wanted this to go viral even more, and placed it on some some kind of some malware. Uh, like, I, I, what do you what do you call it? Like a fake fake views website or something? Jeez, some kind of bot. I don't know. Um, yeah. So it did it did happen basically? Yeah. And uh, really, there. Was, we found out uh, Dustin started a thread in uh, Google support forums, I think that's what it's called, and uh, a couple people told us that there's actually, after they delete the video, there's like not really anything they can do. Um, the, YouTube really has no way of determining how many of the views were actually fake and how many were legitimate. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. basically, if... Um, our video raises any red flags with the uh, automated um, video moderating system, it'll get taken down and we can't really do anything about it except file an appeal and then they'll put the video back up with set everything back to zero. Yeah. So, yeah. Know. Okay. This is a, this has been a <laughs> this has been annoying a little bit during the past week. So let me let me like do a couple of like or one PSA kind of thing. So basically anyone watching our podcast or videos and stuff, um, like whether you support us or, or don't like us, like it doesn't really matter. You're watching the video, so we're getting the views anyway. So it's it's great just having viewers. Um, but w viewers who do like us, don't don't like try and make the video go artificially viral, you know? Um, it'll it'll get traction on its own. If it's good content, then people will share it organically over social media. And you know, we 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 put these stories up 
obviously on YouTube, and we're going to start doing it on SoundCloud as well, the audio version on SoundCloud, and then also the video on Vimeo as well, because YouTube's policies are kind of whack. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, like we we put this stuff out there like enough, and and on Reddit and, and, and social media, Twitter and such, like it will get traction on its own. Don't worry. Um, trying to, tr- to rack up fake views just looks desperate. Like it, it makes us look bad. Cause it, it seems like we were, we were the ones doing it when in actuality it was just some random person who either wanted to attack us or shoot red coins on the moon. Either way, it's not, um, it's, n- it's just not helpful, you know? So that's that's really that's my two cents on it. Yeah, we we really want to build a and like a legitimate audience, you know, from the ground up. And so we just really don't want um, whether it's good intention, whether it's like well intentioned or not. We just mm-hmm. don't want any artificial. Um, we don't want any artificial uh, pl- publicity, I guess you'd call it. Yeah. And. Um, and you know we don't we don't have any monetization on our videos right now, so you know giving us artificial views doesn't really like make us any money or anything. Pretty much all it does is it, it hurts us because um, it, get, it gets our video taken down, and if it happens again, you know our, our uh, channel could get uh, suspended indefinitely. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, so yeah. Yeah, we just we just want to do it the right way. Yeah. So that that would be great if um I mean we we just we have only a few viewers so far. Uh, Coin Brief the YouTube channel has around 20 subscribers at this point. We've been gaining a couple every week, so we're making progress. But yeah, we we thank everyone who continues to watch us. Uh, the the real viewers, the humans watching, and you know please don't set out bots to artificially inflate the viewership. So yeah, thank you guys. Yep, and if you're doing it to hurt us, you're lame. <laughs> yeah, super lame. Super lame and get a life also. <laughs> make or make your own podcast. Try and compete with us. Yeah. Who cares? You know, or join us. I don't care. Free markets. Free markets. Yeah. Don't make try something and, better than us. Yeah, don't just don't try and tear down something that's already built. So, uh that that pretty much sums up the red coin video discussion. Um let's move on to another story uh that happened earlier this week. Proton Mail, the encrypted email startup that uh, promises an easy way to use encrypted email to secure your correspondence with other, with other people. NSA can't read it. People can't intercept your emails and, and read them and learn about your private life and all that. So Proton Mail guys are some scientists from MIT and CERN, which is the big sciencey place in Switzerland. That's a technical term, by the way, sciencey place. <laughs> and they are in the process of making this great email application that encrypts your emails and makes it private again. They have an Indiegogo ca- campaign uh, where they're raising funds. They've raised over $300,000 so far. But unfortunately, last week or earlier this week, uh, they had their PayPal funds frozen for no apparent reason. And they didn't have access to their money for uh, around 24 hours. And during that time, uh, they asked people to do Bitcoin donations instead. If you emailed them, you could tell them or verify which Bitcoin donation was yours and which perks you wanted to make it equivalent to the Indiegogo campaign. So uh, (laughs) there was a big uproar that happened on the Bitcoin subreddit and people went crazy uh, because this seemed like an attack by PayPal on uh, privacy-centric email, and PayPal um, actually listened for once and restored the the payments the next day. So, you know, um, Bitcoin supporters, I guess, kind of saved the day again a little bit (laughs) and uh, got PayPal to to come back on board with this privacy email campaign. Yeah, I mean, good for PayPal for listening to uh, the public, but... um... I just really think PayPal is a bad service just in general when compared with Bitcoin. PayPal was really great in the 2000s, you know, when all we had was like um, wire transfers from yeah. bank account to bank account, which uh, are much slower than PayPal. Uh, but now that we have Bitcoin, uh, pay, it just seems like PayPal operates at a snail's pace, you know? Like, yeah, it's obsolete. Uh, 
yeah, it, it's just it it's just outdated. Uh, because Bitcoin is just so much faster. Like even if you don't, even if you're not <clears throat> a hardcore Bitcoin enthusiast like we are, and you know use Bitcoin as like currency. You might just use it as like you know a small investment, yeah. or you use it to like quickly transfer uh, transfer fiat money to another person instantly. Um, you know it's still a better service uh, than PayPal, just because mm. it has instant transactions and like virtually no transaction fees. Mm. Like somebody, uh, pr- almost a month ago now, somebody sent me twenty dollars on PayPal. Um, and not only did they, did PayPal take a dollar out of that, so I only have $19 now, access to that $19 for three days until July 6th, and I got the money, like, almost a month ago. Yeah. Um, if, you know, if somebody sends me $20 on the blockchain with Bitcoin, I'll have it, I'll have it instantly, and I'll get six confirmations, you know, within, like, 10 to 20 minutes, and then I'll have complete control over it. So... I just think PayPal is really outdated and Bitcoin is way cooler. Yeah, it's obsolete. And I think this this whole Proton Mail fiasco kind of proved that in a way because once PayPal froze their funds, what was they said it was it was because of an error, like they they're not totally used to dealing with these crowdfunding campaigns yet, which is weird. Like this is we're in the middle of twenty fourteen and PayPal still hasn't figured out an efficient way to do to do you know, crowdfunding campaigns yet. I mean, Kickstarter is going crazy and they still can't do this. But, like, they they froze the funds and the Indiegogo uh, people just said, okay, just, or no, the, the, the ProtonMail people just said, use, use Bitcoin instead and use just regular credit card transactions instead because those still worked as well. It's just PayPal that didn't work. So, it's like, if PayPal wants to be jerks and freeze people's funds all the time, they're just going to use something else to bring in the money. They're going to use Bitcoin instead, which is faster and, and lower fees and everything. And they realized that, you know, PayPal realized that we um, are just going to use a different system if theirs doesn't work for us the right way. Yeah, and I hear, I've heard stories before from YouTubers uh, who make a living from making YouTube videos. Yeah. Uh Oh, a lot of them use PayPal when, because you know their their entire business is online, and PayPal is obviously faster than traditional uh, uh, banking wire transfer services. Yeah. And so a lot of a lot of their uh, a lot of their uh, monetary transactions are happen on PayPal. Mm. And one story in particular that uh, sticks out in my mind is FPS Russia uh, told a story on a podcast that I watch. About how one time he got he got a payment. Uh, he he made a business like some kind of business deal with somebody, and they sent him like I think it was like forty thousand dollars to his PayPal account. And um, PayPal decided that that was a suspicious activity, and they just uh, locked his account up, and he didn't have access to the money. And when he was telling the story, it was like um, it was like three or four weeks after this happened. And so, you know, forty thousand dollars is a lot of money, mm-hmm. uh, and um, so that's just like a month, basically, where he's just got forty thousand dollars to get in a PayPal account that he has no access to. Yeah. And uh, it's, yeah, PayPal does some pretty ridiculous things sometimes. Yeah, the drawbacks of a centralized payment processor, right? They yeah. have the power to just freeze funds, and um, when when the Proton Mail thing happened. And uh, during the during the 24 hours when they didn't have access to the funds, they emailed PayPal and asked them what was going on. Or no, they they talked to a to a customer service rep, and the rep said that uh, possibly uh, the account was frozen because the uh, the encrypted mail e- encrypted email doesn't have government approval uh, to to they don't have approval to do that from the government. So that's why their funds were frozen. Okay, that brings up several different pro- problematic questions. Like number one, since when does PayPal try and enforce you know uh, federal laws? Number yeah. two, since when is it even illegal to 
to encrypt email. <laughs> but it's it's crazy. We have the Fourth Amendment in the United States, first of all, and it's in the Constitution. You can't uh, the the government can't go into people's private documents and letters and such. And encryption is specifically uh, protection against that intrusion. So it doesn't make any sense why you would need government approval approval yeah, to do yeah. that. And also, also we can just we can do whatever we want with our property. Now that's guaranteed to us by the Fourth Amendment too, because mm -hmm. uh, it, it says all persons shall be secured in their in their property and their effects. So you know that basically means not only do we have the security from government snooping, but um, pretty much whatever we do with our property is our own business. Yeah, it's secure so, from PayPal as well, or it's supposed yeah, to be. Yeah, so PayPal really has no place telling people what they can and can't do with their emails, and they they got a lot of flack uh, from PayPal, uh, not PayPal, from uh, the Bitcoin subreddit about that, because yeah. um, I saw a lot of people, they're like, oh, what? Is PayPal like slaves to the NSA now? Like, what's going on here? Yeah. It's ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, this is just one more example in in a growing list of of PayPal of examples of PayPal trying to uh, manipulate people's funds because it, you know, it, it it drew red flags of being suspicious or whatever. Um, the biggest, the highest profile example couple years ago is when um, people couldn't donate to WikiLeaks anymore because of what WikiLeaks revealed about the US government and other governments around the world and then PayPal wouldn't let people donate like when a payment processor starts restricting people from making payments uh, that's a serious issue and that's just one more example of why PayPal is now becoming an obsolete payment processor and why Bitcoin is superior. Yep, use Bitcoin. It's way better and it's more valuable than the dollar. So that's cool too. There you go. Deflation. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's, let's move on to our last topic for today, which is that uh, we have a new list or a new example on the long list of big retailers who are accepting Bitcoin. This is a big one that a lot of people were waiting for. Newegg.com is now accepting Bitcoin on their website. So, uh, you know, now you can go on Newegg and buy all kinds of computer components. There's a lot of really good um, electronics selection there. So yeah, that's a that's, nerds have been waiting a long time for this one. Yes, I'm so happy that Newegg is finally accepting Bitcoin. Uh, Tiger Direct is great, don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. but compared compared to Newegg, their selection of things you can buy is just it, it just can't compete with Newegg. You can get anything from Newegg, and um, and now you can get it with Bitcoin, and that's really awesome. Yeah, like uh, I don't shop on Newegg that often. But uh, I have used it in the past for buying like little uh, electronic components that I needed or cables and such uh, to connect something that, and I didn't have the specific cable I needed. They have really good prices on cables and stuff like that. So next time I need uh, a random USB cable or Ethernet cable or something, go to Newegg, get it for pretty cheap, and pay in Bitcoin. So good. good yeah, for them. like like I'm looking to get a. Um... A bigger hard drive for this little Chromebook I bought recently and I wanted to pay in Bitcoin so I looked at Tiger Direct and they didn't have the one that I was looking for and I was bummed about that mm. but they have it on Newegg so you know so now when nice. I'm ready to buy it I'm gonna get it from Newegg with Bitcoin yeah nice nice so yeah I, I I'm I'm gonna take this opportunity to declare uh, that Bitcoin is officially mainstream I'm using this new egg story as as a jumping off point for that. Uh, set it right here, July third, twenty fourteen. Bitcoin is mainstream now. At this point, I'm beginning to feel like every new major retailer that starts to accept Bitcoin, it's just kind of like meh, great, awesome. Like we've got in the just in the past month, we've had Dish, Expedia. Uh, now Newegg, uh, Tiger Direct Canada version of the website, like. 
at this point, it's it's fairly mainstream. We're getting a lot of big retailers accepting it. Uh, you can buy a ton of different gift cards for tons of different stores on gift.com. So really, like at this point, you can buy pretty much anything with Bitcoin, and it's great. Yeah, I, you can basically live off Bitcoin if you want, yeah. which reminds me... Um, I got an email from Zappo about the Bitcoin debit card. I know you wrote an article about it uh, yes, like a month ago or so. Yes. They're going to start shipping out their cards in July. They're finishing up. They're making their final touches on it. Uh, and they're getting ready to ship them out. And that's going to be pretty yeah. awesome. Then you literally can live off Bitcoin if you want to. Yeah. The Zappo debit card is finally coming out in July. Um, they said that all, all the people who previously made um, uh, pre-orders of the card uh, should should have their card by the end of the month. So once that happens, you'll be able to load Bitcoins into your Zappo um, account. They've got two different sides to it. One is a vault, and then one is like a hot wallet for spending. And you'll be able to spend from your hot wallet using the debit card. And the debit card will be accepted basically wherever debit cards are accepted so you know it'll be perfect integration uh between the bitcoin network and traditional legacy payment processors like visa and mastercard and such so that that connection is coming down the pipe and should be pretty interesting to see how that happens yeah i saw a guy he's a pretty prominent member of the bitcoin community but i can't remember his name right now he wrote an article a few weeks ago about um, Bitcoin, how there's like uh, five stages of any revolutionary new technology. Mm. And um, Bitcoin is in the disruption phase where it's like, uh, where it's like directly challenging, um, directly challenging the existing technology that it's uh, meant to replace. Yeah. And he says that's the stage that Bitcoin is in right now. And then when it will become uh, mainstream and used by everybody is when it goes through the user interface stage, uh, which hmm. is which is when the new technology becomes extremely easy to use. Like an example, yeah. I saw like I saw somebody on Reddit making uh, use uh, email for an example. Um, when email was first created, you know it was really hard to use. Um, you could only, you had to, nobody had an email address. You had to type in their IP address to send them a message. And then, you know, the clients were really clunky and, like, not very pretty to look at or whatever. Um, but then when, like, when AOL, Netscape, and all these, all those uh, Internet uh, services started making email easier to use, you know, it took off. Yeah. And so I think, if we're going by this guy's article, I think these Bitcoin debit cards... Uh, is is the first step into the user interface phase. So Bitcoin is definitely going mainstream. And it's yeah. it's crazy because we've just had a constant stream of good news pretty much ever since the beginning of 2014 when Overstock started accepting Bitcoin. Yeah. And ever since then, it's just been nothing but good news. Yeah, and even some of the bad news isn't really bad news for Bitcoin. Uh, the, I mean, the meme, the classic meme on Reddit says, this is actually good news. <laughs> um, uh, the prime example of that is back in February of 2014, everyone had to go through the whole Mountain Gox fiasco and all the media uh, frenzy around that situation. And that was pretty bad news for Mount Gox, and it was bad news for the people who had Bitcoins in Mount Gox. But at the end of the day, Mount Gox going bankrupt and vaporizing and being completely demolished has no impact on Bitcoin itself you can still own bitcoins in a hundred different ways uh without having to deal with mount gox or really any shady exchange anymore we have tons of reliable ways to store bitcoins yep. so yeah uh, mount gox doesn't matter anymore mount, mount gox made all the exchanges better and uh the price is on its way back up so it's just a bad memory now yeah yeah <laughs> just a bad memory that'll Probably make show its face at least a couple more times. Yeah, so you have to deal with yeah, bankruptcy we still don't know proceedings. We still don't know what's happened to the money. So once yeah. once we figure out what what happened to the money, then it'll be a bad memory. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, if if you think about it, like, isn't it crazy to think about like the whole Mount Gox thing only happened just this past February, 
and now we're in July of this year, and it seems really far in the rearview mirror already. Like so yeah. much stuff has happened since then that yeah, it's it really is almost a bad memory already. Yeah, it actually um it actually like crashed and shut down in late twenty thirteen, right? And then and then it announced bankruptcy and then in February everybody found out that their money went missing. No, well in February was like there were signs of problems way back in, in twenty thirteen, but early this year in February was when um it really just it just took a shit and completely blew up. Um the price plunged to a hundred and thirty dollars on Mount Gox, which was not a real price um because like the other exchanges weren't any close to that but it, uh that's when trading completely stopped on the site uh liquidity was revealed to have been non-existent completely on the website uh they were not solvent at all people had suspected for many months prior that they weren't solvent but then it, it finally came out proof in the pudding um the website just blew up, you know, uh, the exchange, people couldn't exchange Bitcoins anymore. And that was the whole point of the website. So yeah, it, it, it and, and they're still going through bankruptcy proceedings. Um, I think recently a U.S. court actually approved the bankruptcy for Mt. Gox and, you know, and, uh, and, and, and the latest development that actually happened this week concerning Mt. Gox was people who had money there, I think uh, fiat money only on the site have started getting letters from a Japan court uh, saying that, okay, here's the procedure you have to do to claim uh, your your money that you want from the court proceedings because they're going to, I guess, they're going to try and pay out all the people who held fiat money on Mt. Gox. Well, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Now we just need to get our bitcoins back, which I don't think will happen. No, I don't think that's gonna happen either. <laughs> yeah, those are gone. Like who, if if who would pay that back anyway? The government's not gonna pay it back. Mark Carpolis isn't gonna pay it back. That's gone. Whoever has it, yeah. is gonna keep it. It's just it's kind of sad though because there's only 21 million bitcoins, and you know the more bitcoins that get lost, the harder it's gonna be for people to actually use it. Because if it gets too scarce, then you know it's not really going to be a great currency, which kind of sucks. Hmm. And what was it like? Six hundred, six hundred thousand were lost in Mt. Gox. That's a lot. That's that. I don't. Is I don't know lot. if that's an accurate number, but if it is, that's close to a million. Right. Right. So. Yeah, and well, honestly, I I think that I mean they're not they're not gone gone. Like someone still owns them. Someone's probably going to dump them at some point or is slowly just spending them on stuff. So they're still out there somewhere, and they're still part of the economy, and they're probably just gonna sit for a while 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 the court proceedings finish out. But uh, yeah, yeah, pretty. Um, Mount Gox was a mess. Kind of, we kind of went off on a tangent right there into Mount Gox territory. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, you know, we're making progress. We're making progress. The the thing with a brand new like economy, brand new financial structure that pops out of nowhere like this and people are trying to build infrastructure around it is you're going to have some high profile failures. You're going to have something like Mt. Gox happen eventually where if the majority of people who use the service, you, who use Bitcoin, store it or whatever through a particular exchange that is not regulated, that is run by incompetent people, then you're going to have a failure. And that's why during this year, 2014, you're seeing a lot of infrastructure pop up and a lot of reliable exchanges and businesses pop up to really make sure that such a high profile failure doesn't happen again. It's the free market correcting itself. Yeah, people, I think people would just have to make a choice uh, when they're deciding between uh, deregulated free markets or government safety nets, you have to decide between having a product or using a currency that's constantly improving uh, but has a few hiccups along the way or using a product or a service or a currency that is stagnant, depreciating, yeah. uh, but you never have any risk. Um, I would I would rather have something that's constantly improving and then have a little bit of risk than yeah. have something 
where I can never lose, but I'm not really ever going to win either. Right, right. And, you know, uh, risk is kind of fun in life anyway, you know? It's, it's yeah. fun to take risks. And usually risks are more profitable in the long run. Yep. And that's what that's the point with Bitcoin, right? We're gonna we're gonna yep. we're all taking this risk t together, this experiment, as uh, some of the developers call it, and uh, seeing where it takes us. Trying to build a brand new financial system out yep. of the rubble that happened in two thousand eight with the old system. Risk is what makes life fun. Yep. What would the human experience be if we didn't lose every once in a while? It would be very boring. <laughs> Definitely, yes. And uh, some people choose to try and live in that system. But uh, as for us, we will continue taking risks. We will continue using Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. And also, us personally, uh, we will continue talking about recent news in Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. So uh, that pretty much sums it up for this episode of the Coin Brief Podcast. I'm Sean Wentz. I'm Evan Faggart. And um, we'll see you guys next week.